Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Tuesday, September 17th, 2024 meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. My name is Donna Lascalia. I'm the Director of Public Works, and I'm the Chair of the Commission. Uh, Beth, when you are ready, please call the roll. EPW Director Donna Lascalia. Here. Uh, Planning and Sustainability Director Carolyn Mish. Here. Parking Enforcement Administrator Nancy Forrestal. Here. Councillor Alex Jarrett. Here. Councillor Deborah Clemmer. Here. Citizen Devin Bruce. Here. Citizen Diana Day Foskett. Here. And Citizen Jamie Albro Fisher. Here. We've got eight present members. Okay, thank you, Beth. And uh, Chief Cartledge is not with us this month. Okay, so um, I just want to announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Uh, so first up is public comment. If you are here um, to speak on a subject which is not on the agenda, you are welcome to do so now. If you're here to talk about something that's on the agenda, I ask that you hold your comment until that time. It just makes for a more orderly meeting. Um, for those folks who are here to speak to us for public comment, um, we are not able to respond to you, but you are welcome to speak to us. Uh, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes, and I just need your name and city of town of residence uh, for the record, please. So first up is Claudia, and we will unmute you. Uh, just need your city or town, please. Go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street in Northampton. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little, <clears throat> you know. First, I want to comment for David Farrell, um, use a bit of his time. David cannot, could not make it, not because he couldn't physically make it, because he doesn't really have the stamina to come back in front of the board. I don't know if people know who he is. He abuts the 107 development on one on William Street. Uh, his property is right next door. He's the man who, when city... Uh, City apartments went in some years ago. His his backyard started flooding, and he's had a terrible water problem as a result of one development in our neighborhood. For that, he operates his own sump pump system at his own expense. So he's stressed out already by the city. The man had a stroke of, um, some years ago, so he's a bit hobbled, and he just felt he couldn't face the commission, to be honest. So I'm just here on his behalf to say it's been a nightmare for him, the construction at 107. And somehow when these projects get approved in a small neighborhood like ours with narrow streets, the idea of where to construct, pardon me? Uh, hello? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Claudia. Go ahead. Okay, so I heard someone talking. So somehow when projects are like this are put up in a neighborhood, the idea of where do the trucks park, not just the big trucks, but all the service trucks, it's been a nightmare in the neighborhood. And for David, who's a bit hobbled and has difficulty walking already, and is very stressed out by the project, it's been particularly difficult. So he felt he couldn't come to my house to speak to you today. And so in, I, I assume everyone got my email with the photographs, you know, and in Carolyn's response, she said we should be calling the city when there are problems. Well, we would be on the phone constantly. I mean, we'd be just every minute of every day <clears throat> be on the phone with you about the traffic problem caused by the parking vehicles, whether it's dump trucks or, or it's just been horrible. So I'm just taking those few minutes to say to you that David Farrell has some serious concerns and, and this business about his fence, I, I he's getting the email, so he'll straighten that out. I, I really want to talk to you about the possibility of collaboration, something I feel like the city has not taken seriously with our neighborhood. Um, I, I get this response from Carolyn that says we're going to go in a queue about traffic calming. And now just uh, some minutes ago, I've sent you all some pages from our original traffic calming committee. It was a neighborhood committee that met for three years from 205 to 208. At that point, we were put in number 44 on a queue for traffic calming. Now it's 20 years later. So where are we on the queue? Um, you can't really tell me honestly that we're gonna have to start again with the issue of traffic calming. We've had in the neighborhood 
three different traffic calming committees, gathering data, talking, asking for the city to collaborate with us. And we've gotten nowhere. We have speed bumps that are totally ineffective on William Street. That is a neighborhood consensus. We're now organizing another traffic calming committee. But hey, Claudia, the, that's three the, minutes. If you could finish your thought, please. Yes. Um, I want to say this, you know, let me just take another second or two. Hey, Claudia, you've got three minutes. Okay. We, we need to just stay with the three minutes, please. If you could just, if you could just finish your sentence. We've been waiting 20 years for someone to help us here. Just let me just finish, please. One last st statement. Hey, and that yeah, is Claudia, Claudia, we have to run an orderly meeting. Okay. I appreciate your comments. Thank you so well, much. Okay, next is Betty. Betty, we're gonna unmute you. Just need your city or town of residence, please. Betty, you should have a message that asks you to unmute. Yep, there you are. Go go ahead. Right, I live at 307 Hatfield Street. My name is Betty Petrosic. And um, our group from this intersection community has been spending a lot of time putting calming, traffic calming um, notifications out on the website. And we have been fruitful in getting um, a four-way stop put in on Hatfield and Cook, and I'm very, very appreciative. I do, however, see problems with tractor trailers, but I guess the uh, people studying will pick up on that. So I was sitting here this morning and one of the tractor trailers couldn't make around the barrel. So he went into the opposite lane to make a right turn down onto Cook to go into the strip mall. Um, but I am appreciative about the four-way stop. I hope it doesn't become a problem for me as a resident, but I think it's a good start. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Next is Hillary. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Hillary Gardner. I live in Florence on Meadow Street between Lilly Library and Florence Fields. So I was checking in to follow up on the status of the speed bumps on Meadow. We're having a lot of issues with the street being used as a speedway. Again, particularly at night, say 10 or 11, when the road is seemingly clear, so the cars speed down it, or early morning, 7 a.m., 7.30, when the trucks are using it to speed up in the hill through the center of town. We're again seeing the road being used for a confluence of events, such as today's event at the Civic Center, the fields packed with soccer players, school buses just going by, city buses, community gardens. So we really need some help. We have missing signage at the crosswalk. We have a blind curve. So we have a lot of issues that are persisting. We have a lot of trouble with cyclists, um, vehicles not sharing the road, not yielding to pedestrians. We have not trouble with cyclists, but the lack of yielding and cyclists trying to navigate the Florence Triangle and the corner of Maple and Main. Uh, it's very difficult to get to and from the bike path. Um, so just wanted to put forward that we're still here and we're still waiting uh, to see some solutions. Thank you. Yep, thank you for your comments. Cindy, would you mind putting our uh, website in the chat? Um, Hillary, please send us an email and um, I'll provide a, a, an update for you. Next up is Mark. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead, Mark. Okay, I'm here, I live, my name is Mark Brumberg. I live at 139 Federal Street. Uh, between Milton and Riverside. I travel and walk every day on Federal Street, and I'm here to talk about the parking situation at the entry to the Mill River Walk, where the road has now been narrowed down to one lane with Jersey barriers. 
There is no indication whatsoever that the road is narrowing. I have nearly been hit twice. Cars speed through the one lane, um, narrowly avoiding dogs, pedestrians, and other cars. There isn't sufficient signage. The signage that is up is temporary uh, signs that are plastic coated on wooden sticks. I have personally reattach these signs to the sticks and stake them back into the ground with a hammer any number of times. I am pleading with you to do something now rather than later after someone gets hurt. I understand this is a long-term project. The culvert will not be replaced anytime soon. And I would like to see some action by the city to, uh, to avoid any necessary damage or harm or death. This is not a new situation. I've walked the street here for years on end. There was a hole first in the tree lawn between the road and the sidewalk. It expanded, a barrel appeared, and then years went by before the Jersey barriers went up and our community was told that the, the culvert needed to be reconstructed. I understand this is on the agenda later on, but my issue right now is parking. Parking now and signage. Signage warning motorists that there is a one lane road ahead. There are orange barrels up that protect the Jersey barriers. There's nothing protecting the drivers or the pedestrians. One lane road ahead seems to be a reasonable sign or something to that effect. I'd like to see that those signs go up very soon, meaning, you know, taken out of the garage at the DPW and installed right away. I understand permanent signage is on the DPW's agenda. I've conversed with them, the Parking Commission, and the City Council President, and uh, I understand that is action that will, the process has begun. But winter is not far away. I am getting very tired of reposting the signs, replacing the orange cones in their places, and doing the job that the city public service and public safety officials should be doing on their own. So I am pleading with you to do something now rather than waiting and waiting and waiting until this culvert is reconstructed before putting up any additional signage. I appreciate the time and I appreciate you listening and I'm hopeful that something might happen sooner than later. Yep, thank you for your comments, Mark. Okay. And, I, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, as part I will be doing as part of the meeting to hear about your discussion of the culvert. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Any other comments for us for public comment? Okay. Hearing none. Um, can I get a motion for uh, approval of the minutes from the prior meeting, which was August 20th, 2024, please? Devin, so moved. Second, Carolyn. So Devin made the motion. Who was the second? Carolyn. Carolyn was the second. Okay, is there any discussion on the minutes? Okay, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Carolyn? Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Abstain. And Jamie? Abstain. That's six yeses and two abstentions. Okay. Thank you, Beth. 
Next up is reports from departments and subcommittees. So I have several announcements from the DPW. So our paving project is in progress. Areas to be repaved are the roundabout by Look Park, Spring Street, Loudville Road, North Elm Street, North Maple Street, Chestnut Street, Burt's Pit Road, and Dana Street. Just one um, item of note, the roundabout by Look Park is gonna be closed for night paving between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. starting Monday, September 30th through Saturday, October 5th. And there will be a detour in place. The roundabout will be open to traffic during, during regular commuting hours, but it will be closed at night. So the detour is lengthy. Um, the mayor's office will be putting out a press release on this. Um, a little bit later, but there is signage up now. A uh, contractor did put some signage up um, just for warning motorists. Um, that's going to be uh, a little bit of a difficult spot for people coming through there at night. Um, Smith College pedestrian improvements. This work includes the installation of rectangular rapid flashing beacons, uh, which are pedestrian crossing signals, signs and paving markings at several intersections along Elm Street and West Street. Um, we expect the RRFBs to be delivered um, I think the last date I had was the 20th, um, so these should be installed by the end of the month, which is good news. Uh, pavement markings, folks might have uh, noticed that uh, we've restriped um, quite a bit of the double yellow center lines and the fog lines and the crosswalks throughout the city. Um, so the contractor continues that work. Um, we also did uh, enhanced crosswalk markings at the intersection of Earl Grove and Texas Road, um, as well as new parking spaces on Fruit Street. Uh, we're doing some uh, water main work on Route 10 by Earl Street. We're replacing 650 feet of water main. And after that project is completed, Mass DOT will actually be mobilizing to do some intersection improvements at Route 10 and Earl Street. And that work is going to include new concrete sidewalks, pedestrian curb ramps, crosswalks, and pedestrian signals. Um, there's also Mass DOT projects ongoing, uh, Damon Road uh, continues, as well as work on the I-91 bridges, um, and questions on those should be directed to Mass DOT District 2. So those are DPW updates. Um, Carolyn, do you have anything for us? Uh, mostly just the rest of the things that are on the agenda, but uh, just a quick update. We finally were <laughs> got responses for um, a uh, contractor to install the covered bike shelter for Pulaski Park. It's been um, really pulling teeth to get someone to respond, but now we have five respondents. So we hope that to finally wrap that project up and get that shelter installed um, this fall. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Anyone else have any updates for the commission? Okay, hearing none, we will move to matters before the commission. So first up is a proposed ordinance for off-street parking areas and off-street accessible parking spaces. Um, so the uh, ordinance is pretty lengthy. I'm going to skip reading it and i um, going to hand this off to Carolyn to talk to us about um, what this is. Um. Even though there are a couple pages here, this ordinance is pretty straightforward. This is this is what will formally allow the city to um, install a kiosk and charge for parking behind the former probate court at 33 King. Um, so this is just the um, language set up to um, allow that to happen. I understand from Brian Bischewski that the kiosks have been ordered, so they um, be ready to be installed and it'll be the same, um, sort of be the, a similar class lot as the other lots that are off Main Street. Um, the other strike throughs on this page are just sort of leftovers. They should have been stricken. The Union Station lot was modified um, a couple of years ago and this reference should have been deleted, but somehow it missed the boat, so we're just um, um, putting that back in, and that's the only reason why that, it's just sort of a, a cleanup. Um, and uh, again, the Merrick Lane um, notations are just um, um, a, associated with the Merrick Lane access to that rear parking lot. And this will go for formal public hearing, um, 
in front of legislative matters September 30th. It's going to be on the planning board agenda September 26th. Um, this also adds, um, thanks um, for scrolling, the, um, also adds accessible parking spaces, which have to be part of the code as well. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Yep. Any members of the commission have any comments or questions on this? And I should ask if there's any members of the public who have any comments on this proposed ordinance. All right, hearing none, may I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? I make a motion for a positive recommendation. Second. Okay, that's Councillor Clemmer with the motion. And sorry, I didn't catch the second. Was that you, Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion on this? Okay, hearing none, Beth, if you could call the roll, please. Donna? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. And Jamie? Yes. That's uh, unanimous with eight yeses. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Next up is a discussion of culverts on Old Wilson Road, Federal Street, and Love Field Street. Um, so I will start the discussion by saying that the flooding last summer had really significant impact on city infrastructure. Um, and a lot of our culverts are old, they're in poor condition, and they are undersized. And then we get um, really significant storms where a lot of water moves in a short amount of time. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the tipping point for, for some of our more problematic areas. And um, that's, that was the case for us. And we are now in a position where we have to make some decisions about what the best way to proceed um, for these three specific areas, um, that there are certainly um, more potential problems in the city, but let's just start with these three areas. Um, so I, I thought it would be helpful for us to um, kind of give a little background and then have a discussion about what our options are and what the price tag on this is um, and what the best way to move forward is. Um, repairs to culverts and drainage are funded through the city's stormwater uh, enterprise, um, through the stormwater utility. So the stormwater utility is set at $2 million a year um, since its inception in 2014, um, and it has not moved off of that value. So that's the funding that we're working with. Um, and with that money, we are running a fairly large operation, um, including catch basin cleaning, including, um, you know, miles of, of uh, pipe maintenance. Um, so just our regular operations. Um, but we also have to look at capital projects. So all three of these culverts would be capital projects um, because the culverts are in poor condition. Um, Lovefield Street is completely closed. Federal Street is partially closed and Old Wilson Road is heading in that direction. Um, so that's just a little bit of context. And now I'll turn it over to Carolyn to talk specifically about Old Wilson Road. Thanks, Donna. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and get my PDF here. Um, oh, hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm to get that up. Um, yeah. um, so if you can see the area we're talking about where the yellow arrow is. Um, this is just generally the, the culvert location on Old Wilson Road. Old Wilson Road connects um, from Rocky Hill Road down to Florence Road, um, but and sort of is a shortcut, um, if you will, really. I mean, there are some residents along there, but um, 
it's a connector between Route 66 and Florence Road. Um, this area I've labeled as Pine Grove um, open space. So the city purchased this um, um, back in um, a few years ago for, uh, to um, start a restoration of the golf course and let it regrow into um, the sort of more natural state after it uh, and replace and dig up the manipulated drainage that was created for the golf course. As part of this um, pro project and process, our consultants have um, been looking at ways to create access, pedestrian and, and bicycle access, but also really look at the bigger picture of the restoration process um, uh, opening up and allowing more of a free flow of wetland resources, the streams that run through there. So this, this culvert actually on Old Wilson Road carries the water that had it become the water feature in the Pine Grove Golf Course. So this was the source of the streams running through that were sort of directed in a way and, and um, dammed on site to create the ponds and um, irrigation, frankly, and then also just the, the remaining sort of um, runoff, but they were, they were channeled um, to run through the entire um, project, so, or the entire golf course. So um, our consultants have um, have uh, recommended that we evaluate in more detail removing that culvert, opening the stream up where it crosses Old Wilson Road to allow the water to flow more naturally. It create there's a natural sort of floodplain environment there. Um, and the idea would be it's, um, as Donna mentioned, this is a... Um, you know, a source of uh, problem that's undersized for the storm events that we're seeing. It's in a low-lying area. So it really is sort of one of those areas that um, would um, cost the city a great amount to, um, to, to clean up or deal with if we had significant flooding. I'm just gonna scroll down here. This is what it looks like in Street View. So you can see the open space um, conservation area kiosk there. So it's right near the entrance where that um, stream crossing is and, and it flows into this um, portion of the recreation um, conservation area. Um, so as Donna mentioned, typically these costs are um, you know, borne by the city, but we have an opportunity here because we have um, funding from the Division of Ecological Restoration um, to that would support both the design for how we would open this back up and then potentially the actual construction of removing the culvert and creating um, parking spaces um, on each end. So effectively you'd have sort of two dead end streets that then um, there would just be a pedestrian sort of bridge crossing over the stream. Um, and then I just wanted to show you um, some renderings. The design team has are, has put together uh, about what this could look like. Um, it's going to go over here to um, uh, other view. Um, whoops, I go across here. So I don't know if you can see this um, screenshot from Fuss and O'Neill. So. Um, instead of having the road cross, we'd probably pull back the pavement and have a little bit of a parking area. It also allows for accessible parking to, um, for accessing the conservation area. And um, we, have, we would have that opportunity sort of on both ends of that. So um, we're just beginning the conversations now. We've sent notice to the counselors. This is officially, this area is in ward um, Four, but on the west side of Florence Road um, is Ward 6. And so we want to make sure we're engaging with the residents there um, to talk about the implications. Of course, there is the traffic signal at the intersection of Park Hill or Route 66 and Florence Road. So anyone coming north on Florence Road can just continue on to that intersection if they're coming into downtown Northampton and the same if people are heading from Northampton to East Hampton, they still have the traffic signal at Florence and, um, and Route 66. Um, 
So that's Old Wilson Road. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. And I, I'm I'm wondering if if you'd be willing to just talk a little bit about, you know, anytime we talk about sort of closing a road and restoring a stream channel, I, you know, there is some alignment with um, city priorities and city climate goals. And, sure. and I'm wondering if you could just talk us through that, because that's actually going to apply to the other two culverts that we're about to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, um, and then the other thing I forgot to mention is we did run the, um, we had our consultants look at the traffic volumes. They were very low, like I think around maybe under 2000 per day. I don't have the number in front of me, but that was sort of the first step to look at what those traffic volumes were. Um, so, yeah, so not only one of the, the, Big reason for looking, of course, the whole reason we're doing this restoration of the golf course is to create and to specifically create sort of this carbon sink for the city to um, help um, offset our um, carbon footprint and our future sort of carbon impacts here in this location. Um, we also, um, so as part of that is bringing um, natural flow back in, allowing the wetlands to, um, to um, um, sort of self-restore, but bring back habitat. Um, the other piece, of course, is um, relative to um, our goals for green infrastructure and addressing stormwater management through um, soft surface or um, green um, means and not um, piping and directing water off site, just sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so our goals um, sort of sprinkled throughout various sections of the um, sustainable Northampton plan and climate resilience plan relate to looking for ways that were um, sort of were um, accommodating stormwater flows and the increase of stormwater, but through more natural means um, as um, uh, which is important to address the um, uh, many of the sort of pervious and, and paved surfaces that we have um, this helps to slow um, the water flow. It helps to um, filter um, the pollutants that are coming um, through runoff from various properties and other pervious surfaces. And that is also um, an issue that um, cuts across all of these other locations that we're looking at for opening up and sort of um, slowing flow and also um, trying to achieve the um, filtration prop, um, goals through um, natural infiltration of stormwater flows. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Councillor Jarrett, go ahead. Uh, do you have a sense of the costs of the various options and what what percentages of those might be borne by the grant in, in, in the case of uh, you know, removing the culvert? Um, so we don't have a cost estimate. I will say that this grant for the, the restoration of Pine Grove would not likely cover the replacement of a culvert. They would certainly cover the um, removal and restoration of the natural stream flow. So we haven't really done an assessment of what the cost would be to rebuild that. Um, So I think the to continue the conversation, we can talk a little bit about Federal Street and Lovefield Street um, it, because really it's it's a very similar conversation. Um, so we can just start with Federal Street. Um, you know, we we obviously have a lane closed here and and recognize the disruption to um, folks in the neighborhood. Um, and we heard a little bit in public comment about the parking issues, which we can certainly talk about. Um, it, but but to just continue the conversation um, and sort of marry it to Old Wilson Road and connect it to Lovefield Street, um, 
you know, we have a lane closed because uh, the deterioration of the culvert has been ongoing for a period of time um, and was really exacerbated by the events of, of last summer. Um, and the culvert is no longer able to carry uh, vehicular traffic uh, over, over the roadway surface. There's actually a danger of collapse at this point. Um, so, you know, the we never want to close a road and, and unless we absolutely have to. And one of the first things we look at is how do we fix this? Um, or let me back up. Can we fix this? Um, meaning, can we repair it? And the answer is here, no, we can't repair it. Um, so now we have to look at options to reconstruct or um, alternately, we look at an option to remove. Um, what we find is that the stream crossing standards uh, in Massachusetts and the permitting are quite strict. So we're not looking at a scenario where you just kind of take out what's there and put something equivalent back in. Um, that, uh, that is unfortunately um, it not um, it, not the way it, it works. Um, so we'd be looking at the construction of a much larger structure, uh, an almost bridge-like structure um, with a price tag that is it, far in excess of a million dollars. Um, I talked a little bit about um, the limitations of the stormwater utility to fund work like this um, and just sort of our funding limitations in general. Um, so as Carolyn said, you know, there are grants available for stream restoration. So when we're looking at a capital project um, that is this expensive, uh, we have to look and say, you know, is there an alternative? Um, and could we uh, close the road, much like old Wilson Road, create ped pedestrian and, and bicycle passage over the stream, um, create you know some sort of small uh, turnaround slash parking area on either end, and what would the impact be, and does that make financial sense to the city? Um, so I thought that this was a good forum to start that conversation. We have a consultant working for us, um, and we have not developed plans as far along as Carolyn is with uh, Old Wilson Road, but we are starting to explore options um, and so it's a good time to have this conversation. And now I just briefly want to talk about Lovefield Street. So it's it's a very similar scenario, except Lovefield Street is completely closed. And it's completely closed because the culvert has entirely collapsed. So if you were to um, turn off of Route 10 and go about 1,500 feet headed towards the city limits, um, that is where the road is closed. And it has been closed since um, since last summer. Um, the replacement of this culvert, so same thing we looked at, can we repair this? The culvert is beyond repair. So at this point, it is a replacement or a removal. Um, and so again, you know, there's not a lot of funding for replacement, but there are promising programs that help with removal because it's a good environmental endeavor. Um, so any of these scenarios have impacts to abutters, they have impacts to people who are passing through the area. Um, the price tag associated with a rebuild of these culverts is, you know, for Lovefield Street, probably pushing a million dollars. For Federal Street, it is in excess of a million dollars. Um, the price tag for, you know, a dead end and sort of a, a little parking area and a turnaround you know, would be expensive, but there would be grant funds to offset that. Um, so the financial impact to the city is far less than a replacement, which, um, by the way, could, you know, have a problem in a future storm that that we can't predict. Um, so that's sort of the executive summary of all three areas. And I'm looking for input um, from the commission and from any members of the public who might be here um, just on any or all of these areas or, you know, and, and to just sort of guide our work as we move forward. Um, you know, we're trying to come up with good alternatives and think a little bit outside the box here, pardon the pun, um, and, and do something that's in alignment with uh, our climate goals, um, as Carolyn talked about. So just looking for 
um, a little bit of input on that. And that will, of course, drive decision making um, around, you know, parking and congestion issues um, to the extent that they exist on Federal Street. So any comments for us is to inform our work as we move on this. I'll just add um, that this last one, Lovefield Street, is um, what's interesting about this is it's in the same watershed drainage as the um, Pine Grove um, conservation area. So, you know, you're essentially in two locations sort of creating, if we were to close in both locations, creating um, a, a restored stream flow and natural um, stormwater um, sort of, um, um, if you will, holding area or detention area in both of these locations. So it will greatly improve um, it should greatly improve the overall um, um, habitat um, in in both those areas, and that leads that all leads into um, Arcadia um, farther south and east of here. So it does have um, beneficial um, impacts that way. Okay. Thanks, Carolyn. Go ahead, Councillor Jarrett. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> My question has to do with, so what steps will you take in terms of determining how it will affect traffic? I mean, obviously with Lovefield Street, it's already closed. You you know how it's affecting traffic because you've been having that data for over a year. Um, for the others, in terms of doing a full closure, what, uh, what steps would you take to determine how that would affect what would happen? I mean, for Federal, there's a lot of folks who come and park to access the trailhead there. If there was a, you know, they could do that at either end. It sounds like if there was a bike ped crossing, um, and there's also, you know, people who use that to to bypass, say, get around the high school, et cetera. Yeah, and we're working with our engineering firm. I, I mean, to pull, you know, uh, uh, vehicle counts, um, to pull uh, pedestrian and bike counts. Um, which I think fluctuate depending on time of year. It's definitely uh, a cut through, um, you know, when school is in session um, and, and even when it's not, um, but, you know, likely heavier traffic uh, when school is in session at certain hours of the day. I'll also mention that Federal Street, you know, we receive a lot of sort of requests um, and commentary around speeding and traffic congestion on Federal Street. So that's something we're very mindful of. But, you know, if we were to move in a direction of making a recommendation to actually close the road, um, we would have some pretty robust engineering data right, around that to understand where those cars might go instead um, mm -hmm. and, and how that would impact the surrounding areas. Um, and you're correct about Lovefield Street. Lovefield Street is primarily a, uh, a, you know, sort of a cut through between here and, and East Hampton. Um, interestingly, in the year that it's been closed, we received one comment um, and it was from someone who was delighted that it was closed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the only comment we've received on Lovefield Street and in and, and all that time. Um, I, obviously, Federal Street is uh, a, a little bit of a different uh, animal. Yeah. And I, I understand in terms of the, the, if you could just touch on um, Mark Brumberg's comments around the parking situation, are we looking at putting in more permanent signs there and, and possibly doing a, an ordinance for more permanent? It, yeah, I think that, it, you know, the temporary signs, it's very disappointing um, how folks, um, a, you know, are, are sort of working against a, a public safety issue. Um, and, and that's very disappointing for us. Um, the temporary signs obviously are not working. Um, we are going to be installing permanent posts. Um, we have a, a uh, we have to uh, dig safe it and um, and set the permanent posts, um, which obviously can't be pulled out. Um, and then temporary signs will be affixed to the permanent post. So we were going to try that strategy um, and make it a little bit more difficult for vandalism. You know, to ask council for a permanent ordinance here, 
you know, once there's a permanent ordinance on the books, it would have to be repealed if something were to change or if the road were to be discontinued. Um, and maybe you would have a comment on what you think might be council's willingness to entertain something like that um, in light of the uncertainty around this road and the conversation that we're starting to have. I'm not sure how you would feel about sort of voting for, a, you know, a permanent ordinance that may not be permanent. Right. I mean, I think if we could get the, the temporary signs to be permanent, so they're difficult to, or rather not permanent, but uh, affixed, so they're difficult to remove until we have, know the direction we're going to go in. Um, that sounds wise. Yeah, and that's the plan, and and th that will be that will be resolved shortly. Okay, and then the issue of the one lane ahead and the advance warning on that is that something that that can be added? Yeah, I think what we can do is we can put more permanent signage in. That doesn't require a um, an ordinance, mm -hmm. um, so we can certainly dress that up with more permanent signage. I mean, the the barricades are painted fluorescent, so they're they're definitely um, visible, and we've got quite a bit of reflectors out. Um, but you know, you can always improve signage, and we're happy to do that. Um, you know, before uh, the winter season, uh, certainly. So appreciate those comments, and and we can look a little more closely at that because there will not be resolution on this before we have to start pushing snow around this winter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments from any members of the commission? Mark, I see your hand up. All right, so Mark, we'll unmute you, go ahead. There we go. Yep, go ahead. So I'd like to thank, thank Alex for addressing two of my points. Uh, the one issue or two issues that haven't been addressed, uh, you talked about the increase in volume of traffic dur uh, during morning drop off and afternoon pickup. And when faculty and staff come and uh, come to school in the morning and depart in the afternoon, uh, I really think you should involve the schools and any decision to close the road that traffic is going to go somewhere. It's already horrendous in front of the high school where parents pick up and drop off their kids right on the street in front of the no parking signs. Um, secondly, affixing temporary signs to metal poles. I grant it that's one little baby step forward, but people will continue to be pulling those signs down and parking in front of them. My last comment is I would wholeheartedly support the closing of the road and parking areas being created. I, I walk the trail almost every day and so do many other people in the Bay State neighborhood as well as the people from other parts of the city, including the area around Smith College. So that's gonna be a process that takes years, I would imagine, before that is implemented. Is that fair to say? It, yeah, I mean, I think there's a considerable amount of engineering work that would need to happen in advance of any decision like that. And there's also a political process um, that, exactly. that would need to happen. You know, this would have to go through city council and, and there would be public hearings uh, on something like this. So there, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of process associated with something like this on top of the actual construction process and engineering process. So if we're talking about two, three, four years down the road, before the road might be closed, parking areas developed and a pedestrian bridge put in, I think you should consider that when you make decisions about signage, both no parking and the one lane road ahead. Um, there is a hill that people come down from Vernon Street Granted, the Jersey barriers are, you know, a bright yellow green. Uh, people speed. There is little enforcement. 
I, in all the years, I've lived on the street for 16 years. I can count on my hand the number of times I've seen a police car sitting anywhere on Federal Street looking for infractions, let alone the parking officer coming down to look for infractions of people parking smack in front of the signs. I myself, over the last three weeks, have called the Parking Commission two two different times when I just happened to be pat walking by and seeing the this kind of activity. Excuse me, so, three minutes. Yeah. Okay. All right, my, all right Mark. That's all I have to say. I thank you for your consideration, and I look forward to future hearings on this issue. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Anyone on the commission have any comments for us? Um, just kind of as uh, to inform our engineering work is we start to look a little more closely at these areas. Go ahead, Councillor Jarrett. Um, just, just a word, you know, on the process for the decision making about whether we're going to go for a closure or not. Um, you know, I would love to to reach out to my constituents in the area and I'd be happy to host a meeting of some kind um, to have a discussion kind of before we go, we'd make a decision to do it and then the, the hearings and such. So, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me and I can help facilitate. Yep, thank you, Councillor. And these, you know, any type of road discontinuance is, is certainly a, a big decision. Um, so I appreciate the offer and, and it, um, you know, is not something that would sort of, um, happen suddenly. So, um, again, I appreciate the offer and, and we'll be in touch about that. Any other members of the commission have any comments for us? Devin does. It's just a curiosity, but I was on Ward Avenue today and there was a parking enforcement car and a person walking the street. So I can't imagine they weren't working in the neighborhood. Yeah, thanks, Devin. Yeah, and I think, it, Mark, just to just to kind of double down on your concerns, I I hear you know that winter is coming and and that's a hill, it's a tough area, and we'll we will clean that up in a way that makes it feel safer um, before the snow flies. So uh, thank you for the feedback, and and I hear you loud and clear. All right, any other comments on any of these three roads for us? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to update of the bike path rehabilitation project between State Street and Bridge Road. Um, so as I've previously announced, the two and a half mile Northampton bikeway between State Street to Bridge Road is planned for rehabilitation. We're currently out to bid and expect to open bids before the end of the month. Um, so improvements are going to include the asphalt paving of the path, intersection improvements, including curbing, sidewalks, signage, and pavement markings. Uh, we need to do some tree trimming. That canopy is really hanging low over the path and actually uh, contributing to its degradation um, and also making uh, surface repairs like on the shoulders and just sort of uh, stabilizing the sides of the path. Um, so it, it, depending on what sort of price we get, it's going to be a very, very tight schedule to get this done this fall. Um, but we are hoping that, um, you know, sometimes you can hit it right. And we're hoping that we're going to get really good big prices and we can get this done. Our current project estimate is $1.4 million. Um, I believe I've previously announced that we received a $500,000 mass trails grant to offset our costs for this work, um, but that's still um, a pretty big city contribution given all the needs that we have. Um, so we are hoping that our project estimate holds and that we don't end up with a higher number. So I, one of the things that I'd like to talk about at this commission today is that we are going to need to close the entire path during construction and put a detour in place. And the pedestrian and bicycle detour will have to be by necessity Route 9. Um, so, you know, it's not ideal to have to close the bike path. We went through this 
uh, with the drainage project on Adair Place. And we had a lot of challenges with a lot of challenges with users of the bike path, vandalizing construction fencing, throwing construction barrels over the embankments, um, and creating the need for enhanced construction fencing and construction controls, as well as security details um, to secure the area so that no one was injured. And more importantly, the contractor could actually do their work in a timely manner and the city would not be responsible for a delay, which actually has financial cost. Um, the project price was actually increased by nearly 20% because of the vandalism associated with people destroying the construction fencing, walking through the construction area, aggressing the contractor and creating the need for um, pretty much constant police details um, or flaggers to sort of clear people out of the area. So I wanted to have a conversation at this commission um, to discuss that it, the path needs to be closed and we have to detour traffic. And this is the only way we can get the path paved. There, There is no other way. We cannot have um, people on the path while the contractor is trying to trim trees and pave it. Um, so I have had a conversation with um, friends of Northampton Trails um, to just kind of forecast what we're going to need to do. Um, I'm just looking for some input from folks on the commission about how we can get best get this messaging out um, and ask for everybody's support to just get through a pretty tight construction window if we do get a favorable bid and just get this done um, without driving the cost up to a place where it's actually unaffordable. Um, so it's more um, just asking for some collaboration with bike path users and how can the city best communicate with bike path users um, so that we sort of go into this with a spirit of cooperation and just kind of get through this construction process. Um, there's definitely the risk that our bids are not going to be good um, and that it's going to be unaffordable because the prices are just too high, at which point we will have to bid it again in the spring. Um, and we'll be having a similar conversation in the spring. Um, but my hope is that that's not the case. Um, all will be revealed um, in the next week to 10 days. Um, so I'm just looking for some input from members of the commission to help us as we move forward with communication or any ideas that you might have. So I'll just open Open it up for discussion if anyone has any comments. Go ahead, Devin. I just think it's a, a helpful idea to get the word out early and people, if they're expecting it to be closed, I think they'll understand. And I think it's an important fact to say that vandalism increased the past project by 20%. Um, my suggestion would be I can work with Forbes. I would appreciate getting the language from you that you would like to make public. And the other thing is to work with the chamber uh, uh, at their arrive at five, their uh, newsletters. I'm just thinking that we ought to put our heads together and figure out how to get the word out. Yeah. Thanks, Devin. Go ahead, Councillor Jarrett. Thanks. Um, yeah, I know having informational signs that describe uh, what's going on in in detail and explain the needs uh, at ideally at each street crossing. Think would be helpful so they can everyone can understand why it has to happen you know a, a map that shows the detour um and you know as much information as you can i will be helpful to for, for i think for people to know um as well as neighborhood outreach and you know i'm uh, happy to do ward five we can reach out to all the other counselors and try to get that that message uh out as much as possible um <clears throat> A, a notice ahead of time too to say you know this this will be closed these dates um so that people also can prepare and can prepare with the proper detour uh, i think would be helpful as well and then my question was is there a risk that we'll see an entire winter closure like if if the there are delays um if, you know if if it, you said it's a very tight time window. Is that is that a high risk? It, does it make sense to do it now, or uh, does it? Is, well, if you could speak to that, that would be great. 
Yeah, but I think it's a it's a very tight window, and if we get a good price, it will be because the contractor believes it can be done. Um, mm -hmm. We we will not be closed through the winter. Um, the asphalt plants typically shut down like the first week in December, um, so we do have some time. Um, and it, it, at the very least, we would like to see a, a base layer down, you know, before the asphalt plants close, which would allow for use uh, over the winter. We certainly would not want any sort of um, dirt surface over the winter. Um, so that would be the push. And, and I think it is doable. Um, again, it all boils down to what the bid price comes back as, but um, it would not be acceptable to close the path over the winter. So that that is not something that we would anticipate. Thanks. Diana, go ahead. I, Diana, I think you're muted. Hold on just a second. Not sure why. I am. Sorry. Yep. There you go. Go ahead. Um, it seems like some of the anger that people in the community might have would be about the detour, and especially if they're having to go under Route 9 in places where they don't feel safe, that they would have a lot of temptation to interfere with the construction. And I don't know if it's even possible, but maybe we could think about whether there are things we could do on the alternate route to make it more appealing or make it feel safe if there's any kind of like temporary barriers that we could put up to kind of add more shelter to places where bikes and pedestrians would go so that it was more accessible to them so that it didn't feel like oh my gosh now I have to fight for for my life with all this traffic on Route 9. Yeah and that's a good point and I'm happy to entertain those possibilities with the caveat that we are sort of pushing into de-icing season. Um, so I do have to be careful with the things that are in the roadway. Um, so there's sort of a balance. It's like, I'm hoping for good weather, you know, just sort of across the board to get this done. Um, I'm more than happy for any feedback that the bike and ped subcommittee may have or friends in Northampton Trails has or anyone on this commission or any member of the public might have I, you know, about what we could do to put some sort of controls in place. The detour is Route 9. Um, the intersection by Cooley Dickinson is is very tricky, and, and we certainly understand that. Um, the, you know, it's it's difficult. We think about, okay, can we put barrels out? Can we put cones out? Um, you know, and, and we just sort of have to be careful what we're putting in the roadway, and does it get sort of knocked around or blown around uh, over time? So, you know, to the extent that there are specific ideas, I mean, it's certainly something we're going to look at, but if there are specific ideas um, that feel doable and within budget, um, it, you know, we're certainly happy to entertain those. So, um, it, you know, be as creative as, as possible, I guess. Carolyn, go ahead. Um, I was just um, thinking that maybe this might be um, rationale enough to use reverse 911 before it's supposed to start um, to notify everyone sort of uh, more uniformly ahead of time. Um, and then I think we probably could get creative about some signs, not putting too much information on the street, but maybe QR codes or something right to the web page. So when people um, don't necessarily, we don't have these long text documents on the side of the road, but anyway, that's all, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just also add that one of our challenges is when we do award a contract, the contractor actually sets the schedule. So some folks may think like, gosh, we had absolutely no notice for the bike path closure for the drainage project. And that's because the contractor actually sets the schedule. So when we execute the contract, you know, we're not sure, like, are you going to mobilize now? Or are you going to mobilize in 30 days? And this contractor was ready to mobilize pretty immediately. Um, so I think when we get to a place, if we get a good bid price and we know this is going to go, um, at that point, we have to make the announcement. But it's going to be very, very difficult to nail down an actual date until the contractor makes that announcement. And that's just sort of standard operating procedure. So I understand people's frustration with the city as though, you know, we're not communicating properly properly or we're not prepared, mm -hmm. but that's just unfortunately the nature of um, a, kind of the, the construction business. Um, so go ahead, Councilor Clemmer. Yeah, just do you know about how long this project will take? Sorry, Councilor Clemmer, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? Do you know about how long this will take? Um, I would anticipate that the 
between the the tree trimming and the shoulder work and the actual paving that we would be running into December. Um, so it, it's going to be multi-week, a multi-week project. So a couple of months easily. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Good conversation. I appreciate it. Anyone else have any comments for us? Brett, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, Brett Constantine, Willow Street, Lawrence. I want to echo the thoughts um, already mentioned, doubling on the QR codes to provide full information, but not necessarily on the sign. And um, something in the roadway. I'm thinking particularly of the stretch of Route 9 that's 40 miles an hour posted and people go much faster. And we've already talked in both Bike Ped and this commission about that uh, that throughway that um, and about what to do about that in the in the long run. Um, and what about Jersey barriers? Not necessarily back to back, but um, creating a protected right hand lane shoulder um, it's definitely wide enough there. You, the other, the at the intersections, it's going to be something completely different. There's not that for, but I wonder about that stretch. Is the fastest traffic dis disparity between bicycle traffic and automobile traffic, and that might help people feel safe. Thanks. Um, thank you, Brad. Okay, Hillary, I see your hand up. I just need your city or town, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Hillary. I, I live in Florence. I, I do um, use the bike path and have been using it increasingly uh, to get to East Hampton or up to Leeds for rec recreation. There are currently signs on the path that say, you know, um, sorry, traffic going by, uh, you know, keep right, et cetera. So I think it's, it could never be too early to have a generic sign that says closures coming to the bike path learn more at this at this space. I think if you're seeing aggressive behavior toward the bike path, it's because people want to walk and bike safely and are seeing like in today's Gazette um, editorial page, you know, pedestrians and bikers are just being treated really aggressively on the road. So I think you're seeing some of that pushback. People also use the trail, you know, to walk dogs and just for recreation. So um, it's also thinking about, about those people, pedestrians who more easily can circumvent barriers and things. Um, I think a lot of bikers already know they have to follow the rules of the road. So, um, but anyway, that would be my suggestion as soon as possible to, to have a general sign, like learn more about closures coming um, so that folks begin to to get that in their head that they that is the safest way to travel by bike in town. So um, I, it is a big deal to close it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hillary. George, go ahead. Hi, everyone. George Kohal from State Street. Um, thanks, yes, Donna and I and uh, some other reps from the Friends of Northampton Trails have discussed this a little bit prior. So we're really really excited to be quite honest to know that this may be happening this this fall and at the worst case scenario in the spring but in terms of the detour i think what we experienced during uh the closure for the viaduct work on adair place is the, uh, the the not the professional but the seasoned bikers use the roads and didn't have a big problem with it many of the young people and the families use the sidewalk um along prospect street and I think maybe what we might want to look at is that continuous sidewalk that runs down North Elm Street, Elm Street from uh, Florence Center, past the old DPW, past this DPW, and straight along. There are, yeah, there are some uh, breaks for driveways and streets, but not a whole lot. Because um, again, as Brett mentioned, I think many bikers will use the, the road by the Smith Oak Field but if you're not an experienced biker, you'll unconsciously, I think, go to the sidewalk, which is in the worst in the world. I think we'll see a drastic reduction in pedestrians who usually use the uh, the bike path for walking and with their friends 
I don't know if he'll be doing that along Route 9 there by the Smithfield Field. So I think uh, there won't be a lot of conflicts on that sidewalk. So we might want to think of that because, again, it's continuous basically from Florence Center all the way down um, across Cooley Dick, down Prospect Ave, across from the YMCA all the way to the next break. Um, so, again, that's just a thought as we start brainstorming here. I also think we have a very robust um, email listserv for members of the Friends of Northampton Trails and social media. But I think we might also need just to do some ambassador work at some of those heavy intersections a week or two before the project starts with uh, simple handouts, little postcards, which FNT would be more than happy to try to recruit some people to do because a lot of people just no matter how much social media we use and calls, uh, it just doesn't register with folks. So again, thanks a lot for bringing this up today, Don, and I look forward to uh, continuing this brainstorming. Yeah, thanks, George. And I appreciate the conversation and, and it, it will definitely take a group effort to um, it, make this project be a success. It, it is going to be um, really, really difficult for us to sort of lock down the entire bike path without um, the cooperation from anybody, so, from everybody. Um, so, it, you know, this is going to be um, pretty fantastic when it's done, and we just kind of need to keep our eye on the prize. So I appreciate the, the conversation and the ideas. Um, does anyone else have any other comments for us on this? And there'll be more communication on this to come, but um, we should have some answers coming up here uh, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, hearing none, I'll uh, move on to new business. Does anybody have any? And hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Make a motion to adjourn. Okay, right. that's Councillor Clemmer, and may I have a second? Second. That was Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Carolyn left, I believe. Yes. Uh, Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Devin? Yes. And she happened to mention. Uh, Diana? Yes. And Jamie also left. So one, two, three. So you have six yeses. That's unanimous from those remaining. Okay. Thanks, Beth. See everyone next month. Take care. Thank you.